Ashley, and uh, we appreciate his zeal and the love for the word. And uh, this time, Brother Brian Ross, his message is the line, the wheel, and the heel. Not the line, which, and the wheel, brother. But the line, wheel, and heel. Morning. And I also want to thank the uh, other men that are associated with the Ohio Grace Ministries. It's always, uh, my wife and I always enjoy coming down here. If you would get out your Bibles and open up to Galatians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, just a couple quick announcements. Um, coming up in October, October uh, 18 through the 20, uh, this year, uh, Dave Reed and I are going to be doing uh, a conference in Michigan on the Gospels. And uh, the title of it is The Gospels Con uh, Project, Accurately Identifying the Different Gospels. And we're going to be talking about the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of God, the gospel of circumcision, uncircumcision, gospel of Christ, and the gospel of the grace of God, and what all those are, how they're different, how they're similar, and uh, just kind of going through all that. So again, that's October uh, 18 through 20 of this, uh, this coming fall. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse... Uh, Verse 4, before we get started, I'm just going to tell you, I'm struggling with a cold here a little bit, and I'm hoping I don't end up with a coughing fit uh, in the middle of this study, so uh, just please bear with me in that regard. Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. The only Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity that we have to study your word with the saints that have gathered here and come from great distances. We appreciate them and the men that are responsible for uh, hosting the meeting. We just pray this would be a time of edification for all those involved. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Galatians 1 4, he says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world? The theme of the conference this week is the grace life in this present evil world. Is there anyone here this morning that doubts whether or not we live in an evil world? Okay? If, you, if, you're, now if you're paying attention at all, you know that the world is evil. The world seems to be. Um, Romans chapter 8 talks about how the whole creation groans and travails. We've seen a lot of that this week with tornadoes and, and hurricanes and just things that are happening in the world. And, and the, the earth seems to be groaning uh, to ever greater degrees and so forth. And we, we sit in a situation where as believers we wonder what is going on. And I know in recent years the saints in our assembly have had a lot of questions about these things. And the title of my study this morning is The Line, the Wheel, and the Hill. A scriptural model for understanding history. What I want to try to do is give you some context to try to understand what is going on in the present evil world. Um, it's going to be a little bit different study when it comes to that. In, in 2009, uh, Brother Jordan at the uh, Soldiers Training for Service in April did an entire weekend study on the issue of uh, welcome to winter. And he was talking about the cycles of history and how history uh, sort of comes and goes in cycles and so on. And he was trying to uh, teach the men about some of those things to give them some perspective about, about the work of the ministry as far as where we are right now um, in, in the, the, the current uh, American society and so forth. I teach world history at the high school level as my secular job, and I start out every year by presenting my students with the famous quote from George Santana. Most of you probably know it. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. How many heard that quote before? Okay, that's a every basic entry level world history student probably has been presented with that, that concept. And I just want you to think about that statement for a minute to get started. Those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The statement encapsulates one of history's great debates regarding the philosophical nature of time itself. Is time and therefore history cyclical? A circle like Hinduism and other indigenous religion, uh, religions teach? Or is time linear? Is it in a line? Is it straight? Is it progressing from one day to the next, to the next, to the next? And historians and so forth debate about these things, about whether or not time is, is cyclical or whether or not time is, is linear and whether or not we're advancing towards anything uh, as we move through time. It's, and if you consider Santana's quote just for a minute, it sort of highlights a paradox. Let me read it to you again. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The paradox is this, okay? Let me find it. 
History is both cyclical and linear. Implicit within Santana's comment is the notion that if humanity forgets about their past mistakes, their forgetfulness will condemn us to repeat those what? Mistakes. But it also has within it the idea, if we remember those mistakes, we can avoid doing what? <laughs> Repeating them now. So there's a paradox within the quotation about, uh, that, that touches what it is that I want to try to uh, share with you here this morning. So, are time and history cyclical or linear, or both? Okay? And what do the scriptures teach about these issues? And this is the goal of my study with you this morning. I want to try to present to you a complete biblical paradigm for understanding history and try to explain to you how that should help you understand what is going on right now in this present evil world. And so I've done that, I've conceived of this, by starting with the concept of the line, the wheel, and the hill. And I'll explain what this is. If you would, get, get two passages. Get, uh, get Revelation chapter 21 and get Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Get Revelation 21 and Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I'm sure another verse that I could have had you get is uh, Genesis 1-1, but I'm not going to do that because I know most of you know that verse. Think for a minute with me about Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God what? Created, Created the heaven and what? The earth. the earth. Okay? I don't know about you this morning, but I do believe in a big bang. I believe there was nothing and God spoke and bang, there was something. Okay? And that there was a beginning. And if you look at Genesis chapter 1, you start off with eternity past. And the only thing that exists in eternity past is who? It's God. God is eternal. He is outside of time. So when, it, when God moves to create, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you have the beginning. You have the point of origin of time and history, right? Before that time, you don't, before that moment, you don't have time. You don't have history. All you have is eternity. So starting in Genesis 1, 1 is a beginning point for something. Come over to Revelation 21. Go to Revelation 21. <laughs> Notice in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were what? Passed away, and there was no more what? See. So I, I know then something, and I know that what started in Genesis 1, 1 is going to end where? In Revelation 21, verse 1. So if I, if I have a beginning, and the Bible tells me in Revelation 21, verse 1, that there's an ending, and I have a point here, and I have a point here, how do I get from this point to this point? Right? What is a geographic definition of a line? Anything that connects two points, right? So there you go. You have the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You have Revelation 21, that the, this heaven and this earth are going are gonna to end, and they're going to be replaced with a new heaven and a new one. A new earth. And so from there you're going to move on. We know from Ephesians chapter 2 that, and we see over here on the chart behind me, that the Apostle Paul speaks about time past. Anything before today is what? The past. Right? He also speaks in verse 11. He says what? But now. Then he talks in verse 7 and he speaks about the ages to come. And so you think about how we as dispensationalists understand the Bible and how we teach how to study the Bible. We are teaching a very linear understanding of time. That time started in the beginning. That time has gone through a series of changes and dispensations where God has given different instructions to mankind over time. And that God tells us in his word in Revelation 21 verse 1 that the current heaven and earth are going to what? going to pass away and going to end. And they're going to be, then we're going to get out into eternity future, or what the Apostle Paul calls in, first, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, the dispensation of the fullness of what? Time. time. The dispensation for the purpose which God created time will arrive. And so we understand, folks, by virtue of our dispensational Bible study, that the basic framework in the scripture for understanding time is a line, is linear. That we progress from this dispensation to this dispensation to this dispensation from the beginning when God created all the way to Revelation 21 verse 1 where, it's going to, where what he originally created is going to end and it's going to be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. 
And so I'm going to submit to you first off that any model for understanding history that does not start with the basic premise of linearism is not right. Okay? And I would also say to you that as dispensationalists, as mid axe Pauline dispensationalists, we are probably the most linear guys around. Okay? Because when we teach the Bible, we are teaching time past, but now, and ages to come in a very linear progression. Okay? So there you have point number one, the line. Okay? Let's move on to point number two, the wheel. <coughs> Virtually all Gentile societies have viewed time as cyclical in nature. Regardless of their geographic location, or despite their lack of contact with each other, pagan cultures all possess a, a circular or cyclical view of life linked to the seasonality that is observable within nature. Pagan holidays and festivals coincided with seasonal occurrences, such as the winter and summer solstices, as well as the spring and autumnal equinoxes. So I want to just give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, okay? This is the Buddhist wheel of life. You know that Buddhists believe in what? Reincarnation, right? They view it as functioning and flowing in a circle. This is the Egyptian scarab beetle, and you see that above it is a what? A circle. The Egyptians had a concept that time flows in a circle, okay? That uh, the, the doctrine is known as the, the doctrine of eternal return, that you start and then you're going to end up back where you started. A few other examples. This is the Norse obelisk. So the, uh, for, the, these are the people from uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. This is the dragon eating its own tail. Okay, this is, a, this is a very cyclical view of how history should function. And made famous most recently, you obviously have the Mayan calendar. Okay? All of these are from different geographic regions. They're from different time periods in history. But all of these pagan societies all have embedded within their understanding of time the idea of a circle. Okay? Now, we as we need to understand a few things about that. Here's another example. This is the pagan calendar. Okay? You can see that it's a circle. So you have Yule, December 21st, then you go through February, March, you get into spring, then you get into um, planting season and so forth, then into June and August, September. And what happens is this when Emperor Constantine supposedly converts to Christianity, and please note the quotes, supposedly, okay? What he does with the Catholic Church is he begins to try to take away these pagan holidays by strategically positioning Catholic holidays and feasts to try to rob the pagans of these, of these events, okay? But it's all based upon this idea of cyclicality. So I have a question for you then. Where do the Gentiles get this idea that time and history are flowing in a circle. Where did the idea come from? Because I've just demonstrated to you that multiple cultures in different times, on different continents, that have no relationship to one another at all, view time as functioning and flowing in a circle. So why would that be? Come with me if you go to Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> Genesis chapter 1. Folks, I should, you need to reject flat out the idea that primitive man was a caveman scratching on the wall in the cave and doing all this sort of thing, okay? If you're going to believe the Bible, you're going to understand that God made Adam as a fully functioning adult male with all of the, with all of the faculties and capabilities that all of us possess here, okay? Adam is not some less than creation of God. He is a total, complete... Um, creation of God that is, that, that is lacking in nothing as far as that is concerned, okay? Now, but he puts Adam into, a, into an environment, and I want you to notice some things. Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Now watch this. And let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days, and what? Years. years. 
Let them be for let let them be for it lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon where? Yeah. The earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was what? Yeah. Good. Now there's a few things I want you to note there. When God makes Adam... He puts him into this environment that he's already created in verse 14 through 19. The sun, the moon, the stars are already in their positions when Adam is placed there. And notice also, there's a, there's a few points I want you to get from this. First, <coughs> excuse me, is this. The alignment and position of the planetary bodies serve the purpose of providing light to what? The earth. The earth. So God is doing all of this creative structure for, so that from the vantage point of the earth, the people on earth will what? Benefit from what he's doing. All right? Second, the relationship between earth and the celestial bodies of the firmament would not only account for the differences between day and night. Look at verse 14. Let, the lights of the, uh, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from what? Night. Did the sun do that? Does it divide day from night? Okay. Not only does it divide day from night, but would also serve as a mechanism for rendering seasons, as well as for counting days, weeks, and years. Look at what it says in verse 14. Uh, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for what? Now you understand what that's about, what, right? One rotation of the earth on its axis, we call that a what? A day. One complete revolution of the earth around the sun, we call that a what? Year. A year. So God is creating the structures of the heavens from the vantage point of earth so that the people on the earth can keep track of and count time in the way that God intends for them to what? To count it and, and to conceive of it. Third point, the dividing of day and night, seasonal differences... And the counting of days and years designed, were designed in verse 14 to serve as signs for the inhabitants of the earth. Look at verse 14 again. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. signs. Folks, the, the very heavens themselves are they created in a way to teach man on the earth doctrine. Okay? And so man is able to look into the heavens and understand something about the God that made him by watching how the heavenly bodies are supposed to function. But notice that they are for signs, and then also after it says signs, it says they're for what? For seasons. Now, the word sign, the Hebrew word translated sign here in the King James Bible, literally means a signal or a distinguishing mark, a banner, or a something that is to serve as a remembrance. So therefore, Adam is placed into an environment, okay, where the very planetary bodies themselves are created in such a manner so that Adam, by looking at them, they'll function for a sign, for seasons, for days, for weeks, and for what? Years. Years. And Adam can tell all of these things just by understanding the environment that God has what? Created. created him. Come with me to Romans chapter 1. <coughs> The problem, though, is this. Does Adam disobey God? When Adam disobeys God and sin enters into the world, does sin begin to distort mankind's understanding of what God made? I told you to turn there and I didn't do it. Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1 with me. And by the way, I agree with Matt Hawley. It's hard to teach a message without going to Romans 1. Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 19. Romans chapter 1, <coughs> verse 19. Watch. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are what? Yes. Clearly seen. Okay? How are they clearly seen? Being understood by the things that are what? Made. Made 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Mankind stands before Almighty God as without excuse, based upon the witness of creation alone. That's what the verse says. Okay? You can have all your arguments against God and the problem for evil and all the stuff that you want to have, but just looking at the complexity of the design of the universe implies that there's some intelligence behind this, and God says man is without excuse based on this witness alone. But watch verse 21. Because that when they what? Was there a time when man knew what all this was for? Yes. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were what? thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Now watch verse 23. And change the glory of the incorruptible God. So all of these things that God put in creation in Genesis 1, 14 through 19, that would signify for signs and for seasons and for weeks and for years and so on and so forth, all of these things, when sin enters into the picture and man refuses to honor God and be thankful, he takes the things that God made and he changes them. Folks, how is it that all these Gentile societies think like this? Okay? How is it that that's the case? A, a, a few points here from Romans 1. First, mankind clearly knew who God was through his creation. Number two, Based on the testimony of creation alone, as I already said, mankind is without, is without excuse for not desiring to retain God in his knowledge. And third, the ultimate result <coughs> of not glorifying God was a lack of thankfulness and vain imaginations and the changing of the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. In short, in summary, mankind took the witness of God through creation and perverted it and distorted it in an attempt to escape accountability before God. That's right. Okay? That's what's going on here. Herein lies the explanation for why virtually all pagan societies in the ancient world viewed time as cyclical. They were simply following the course of this world, a perversion of the knowledge of God that's in creation, authored by Satan, designed to distort the witness that God put in creation. Amen. Okay? Therefore, from the very beginning of time, mankind was aware of the seasonal nature of God's creation. After the fall, the sons of Adam, in an attempt to remove God from their knowledge, took the signs and seasonal markers God established when he created the planetary bodies and hijacked them as part of their religious systems. And herein lays the explanation for why virtually all pagan societies have viewed time as cyclical. Come with me to Romans chapter 14. Now, the thing that you need to understand is has God continued to allow this, this to function the way he created it despite man's distortion of it? Right. Acts chapter 14. <coughs> Acts chapter 14. I'm, Acts 14, I'm sorry. I want Acts 14. If I said Romans, I apologize. Acts 14, verse 16. Acts 14, verse 16. It says here, Who in times past suffered all what? Nations. Nations to walk in their own... So, does God allow the nations to go do what they want? If they want to follow after this stuff, does He allow them to do it? Verse 17. Nevertheless, He left them, He left not Himself without what? Witness. In that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and, notice, fruitful what? Seasons. Filling our hearts with food and what? So understand what's going on here. Just because mankind has sinned and sin has entered into the picture and man has taken the witness of God and distorted it to come up with all this mess that we see up here on the screen, <coughs> did God change the way the thing was supposed to function just because man screwed it up? No, that he continued to allow it to function the way he set it up. And, and the allowing of that was to be a witness to the nations here, according to Paul in Acts 14, that God was still there, that he was still 
that there is still a God in heaven and that things are still functioning the way that God set them up. Now, come with me to Genesis chapter 8. Come with me to Genesis chapter 8. So let me ask you this question while you're turning there. Is God also the author of the cyclical? Yes, sir. The answer to that is what? Yes. He is the point of origin, both of the linear and the what? So that means that as time is progressing from the beginning to the end, that as we get from here to there, there are cycles that are what? That are, that are occurring. Gen uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. Wall while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and hot and cold, can't make up its mind about that this weekend, can it? <laughs> and summer and winter, and day and night shall not what? Cease. Now don't turn there, but you're all familiar with the famous passage in Ecclesiastes, right? How there's a time for this, and a time for this, and so on and so forth, right? All of those passages speak to the fact that when God created, He created, He, he, he made this world that we live in to function according to what? Seasons. Now, mankind, as I've already made the point, has hijacked that and taken that into his religious systems and into his religious thought as a means of trying to escape accountability before God. But it does not change the way God what? Set it up and made it in the beginning. Now, in secular terms, <coughs> where do we see this type of cyclicality today? What's that? That's the business cycle, right? You economists in the room, you know that in an economy, we cycle through such, uh, times of peak, through contraction, through a trough, through expansion, and so on and so forth. And that line is going to continue to do what? Up and down, up and down, up and down. We experience that cyclicality as human beings on earth right now. Another one is this. Think about world history. It is inevitable within world history that a country, through whatever means, maybe it's through military conquest or perhaps even peaceably at first, a society emerges and expands their power base by subjecting their enemies until they reach a summit of sustainable power. And once they reach a summit of sustainable power, they always inevitably do what? Decline. I know what my point here is not to get you scared, but look, listen, if, if you think the United States is immune to this, you're crazy, okay? If you study, what in the study of world history, one of the things that, they, that historians like to gauge where a society is at is the top, ten, the top ten reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire, okay? And if you look at the top ten reasons that historians believe the, that caused the fall of the Roman Empire, we have about seven of them right now functioning in our society. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into what they are. I do that. Here's my little commercial. In the book I wrote about this, What is History? So if you want to buy that and learn more about this, please do that. Um, but the point is, you see this zenith. You see nations rise. You see nations fall. The same way you see that uh, in, in the business cycle. You also see that with... Uh, in China, this is the, the, the Chinese way of uh, conceptualizing of history. It's, it's a dynastic cycle. Then a new dynasty emerges. They become an old dynasty. They lose the mandate of heaven. The loss of the mandate of heaven is manifested through problems, earthquakes, revolts, foreign invaders, and so forth. Then a new dynasty arises and claims a mandate of heaven. And that new dynasty becomes an old dynasty. And the cycle continues to do what? Circle back. Okay. What about God's nation? Come with me to Judges chapter 2. Can we find illustrations in the Word of God of this type of cyclicality within the life of the only nation that God created? <coughs> Look at Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, look at verse 10.
Judges 2.10, And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, and of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtoreth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them, in, and he delivered into the hands, delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for the for uh, evil, for the evil they had done. Drop down to verse uh, 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Yet they would not hearken unto their judges. And when they went a whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with them. The judge and delivered them out of the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings, by reason of them that opposed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they what? Returned. Returned and corrupted themselves uh, more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow unto them, for they ceased not from their doings nor from their stubborn what? Folks, if you study the book of Judges, this is what you see. You see six or seven cycles of the nation of Israel worshiping other gods, God punishing them, Israel crying out to the Lord, God raises up a judge, Israel's delivered, there's peace in the land while the judge is alive, and when the judge is dead, Israel just what? Goes back. Do we see this type of cyclicality in the life of the nation of Israel? Do you think of King David... And I think it's rightfully so to do this as the summit of Israel's political power and might. What happens after the reign of David? Right? De decline. Eventually the kingdom is split between Israel and Judah. And both Israel and Judah are eventually taken over by who? By the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles are ushered in politically as Israel falls from, from their political standing in the earth. Now, we understand spiritually they were still God's favorite nation until the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. But politically, Israel also falls. <coughs> Therefore, folks, come, come with me if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Eventually, both Israel and Judah were conquered by Gentile powers, thereby ushering in the times of the Gentiles politically and completing Israel's fall into political irrelevance due to her habitual unbelief. Despite having succumbed to the same cyclical collapse of Gentile nations surrounding Israel, time marched on. The linear was driven forward by the covenants and promises that God made to Israel. Did God make covenant promise with Israel that he has to fulfill? Yes. yes. So even though the nation does not do what they're supposed to do and falls politically, has God still made promises to that nation? Have those promises been fulfilled yet? No. So you know then that time still, those promises are going to continue to drag time forward until they culminate in the fulfillment of those promises. But as that time is moving forward from the beginning to the end, the cycles of history are going to continue to what? To turn. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 2. <coughs> Preach the word. The instant, in season, and what? Out of season. Folks, is there going to be times in the life of a nation that are going to be fruitful times for the preaching of the gospel? Are there going to be other times in the life of a nation that are going to be unfruitful? You're going to labor and not see very much fruit. 
Paul says you don't change what you're doing to, depending on the season. You continue to do what you're supposed to do, and that's preach what? Amen. The Word. So, if we take these ideas and put them together, <coughs> linearism remains a predominant biblical model for conceptualizing history. History began in Genesis 1 and progresses in linear fashion until the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21.1 and the dispensation of the fullness of time. <clears throat> so now in this section here, as time progresses forward in linear fashion from beginning to end, the cycles of seasonality occur. Economies expand and contract. Civilizations rise and fall. Mankind vacillates between periods of rejection and reception of God's truth. The main point here is that history is headed somewhere. And if cyclicality alone were true, history would never get anywhere, and thus linearism must remain the predominant, spell, apologize for the spelling mistake, paradigm for a scriptural perspective of history. If all you have is a circle, you never get anywhere. But if you understand that God created it, and it's heading to, listen, has God predicted the end? Look at this chart here. Do you know there's going to be a 70th week of Daniel? How do you know that? His word says so. Do you know there's going to be a second coming? How do you know that? His word says so. Do you know there's going to be a millennial thousand year reign? How do you know that? So all of these are promises that are found where? And I'm going to submit an idea to you, however controversial it may be. The only things that you and I can know for sure that God has predetermined and pre uh, uh, that God has predetermined to happen are the things that He's told us right here. That's it. Was this meeting predetermined? Edward planned it, and the other man. Did God foreknow that this meeting was going to occur? Did God predetermine that this meeting would occur? No. Does God foreknow the 70th week of Daniel will occur? As he predetermined it will occur. How do you know he's predetermined it will occur? That book what? It says so. So anybody that tells you something is going to happen outside of a verse of scripture, you can, you can know pretty clearly that you probably shouldn't listen to him. <laughs> now, so we've seen that. Come with me if you would to Daniel. We're still missing a piece. How much time do I got, Ed? Forty-three. I've got two hours. Forty-three minutes of tape. Daniel two. Daniel 2, verse 35. <clears throat> Daniel 2, verse 35. Now, uh, this is the, 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 the image here that um, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar sees. Uh, for the sake of time, I just just, just look at verse uh, 34. Uh, then uh, thou sawest till a stone cut, uh, cut without hands which smote the image upon the feet and, and, and uh, that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken into pieces, um, and, and so on. Drop down to verse 36. This is the dream and the interpretation thereof. Uh, we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Verse 37. Uh, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power, uh, kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Verse um, 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, uh, hath he given uh, in, into thy hand, and hath made them rule over all, uh, all them. Now watch for the end of the verse. Thou art the head of what? Gold. Gold. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom that is what? <laughs> Inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall, be, which, which shall bear uh, rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong of iron, for as much as iron breaketh the pieces that subdueth all these things, and as iron breaketh all these uh, shall, it, shall it break in pieces and bruise, whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now, what's happening here? You start out with the image, and the head is what? Gold. 
that it specifically tells you in the next passage that the kingdom that's going to follow after Babylon is going to be superior or inferior. inferior. And it is characterized in the, in the dream here as silver. Right? And then you, go, you work your way down the image, and then next you have uh, brass, then, then iron, and then iron mixed with what? What's happening in that image? What's happening to the, to the value of the alloys that are being associated with it? You start with gold, you end up with iron mixed with what? Clay. And it specifically tells you that each one of them are going to be inferior to the one what? Folks, this is teaching the exact opposite of evolution, that things are getting better and better and better and better and better. This is telling you that things are going to get what? Worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Right? Don't turn there, but the Apostle Paul says, in 2 Timothy 3.13, he says that evil men and seducers shall wax better and better. Shall wax what? So if we have this line... We cannot, if we're going to properly conceptualize and understand history, what do we have to do with this line? you got to make a hill out of it. Because you start here, and you go from here to here, and the only hope man ends up with down here is that Christ comes back and fixes it. Right? So, you think about the title... The line, you got the line, you got the hill, because the line is what? Slanted. And you got the wheel, or the tire, that's doing what? Rolling down the hill. Okay? Now think about it with me. Do you, you know that as that tire gets closer to the bottom of that hill, it's going to end in catastrophe. Right? How do you know that? Because this book tells you. You know that it's going to end up in a big, massive catastrophe, and that the only hope the world has is Christ comes back and does what? Fixes it. I don't have time to, to, to fully bear this out, but I want to close with some thoughts about this dispensation. Come with me to 2 Thessalonians. No, 1 Thessalonians. God is the author of the linear and the cyclical. The line is slanted downward, uh, illustrating the law of human collapse. And I want you to think of it as just these cycles are just like tires rolling down hills. But eventually when they get to the... I watched some video on YouTube. I just got a little humorous. And you, you watch these people load themselves into like a big uh, tractor, a big tractor tire and roll them each other down hills. And when they hit the bottom, bang, you know, you have this, this huge uh, collision and so forth. Well, that, that's what's happening. The Word of God tells you that this is all going to end up in a heap. First Thessalonians chapter 4. So... <laughs> Do you know that the 70th week of Daniel... That's not sitting over there yet, so I'm good. Do, do you know that the 70th week of Daniel is going to occur? How do you know? The scripture says so. Do you know the second coming is going to occur? How do you know? Do you know that the rapture of the church and the body of Christ will occur? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. Now watch this. For this we say unto you, by the word of who? Do you understand that that phraseology there, by the word of the Lord, that when Paul says it like that, what he's doing is he's, he's using a phrase from the Old Testament prophets to signify that what he's doing is making a prophetic utterance. Let me show you a few examples. Come over to 1 Kings. Come over to 1 Kings. When Paul says, For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, he is using the phraseology of the Old Testament prophet to predict the end of the dispensation of grace. 
First Kings. First Kings chapter 13. Yes, we have a First Kings sighting at a grace conference. First Kings chapter 13. <coughs> Verse 1. First Kings chapter 13, verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judea. Now watch this. By what? <laughs> so the word of the, so by the word of the Lord, this guy is, is, is going out and doing this, this man of God. What's he going to do? He goes unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And the man of God, now in verse 2, he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. Notice that, in the word of the Lord. And said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah, by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places to burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Verse 3, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord hath what? Spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Verse 4. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the say of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up. So that he cannot pull it, uh, so that he, can, he cannot pull it in again to him. Now watch verse five. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out of the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of what? So the man of God comes in by the word of the Lord. He says, "This is what is going to what." happen. And guess what? It happens exactly the way the man of God said it would happen by the word of who? Lord. Now look, I don't have time. I'm sitting over here, so i got to quit. <laughs> but there is, in the ten times in the word of God, that expression by the word of the Lord occurs. The only time it's used in the Pauline epistles specifically is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 200 and 55 times in the Bible, you see the phrase, the word of the Lord. Let me just show you one more example, and then I will close. Come over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. There's too many examples here, we don't have time to look at all of them. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Um, verse 20. Ezekiel 28, verse 20. Again, now watch it. The word of the, the word of who? Lord. The Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Zidon and what? And what? You see that when a prophecy is being made, the expression, the word of the Lord always what? Or oh, oh, very many times does what? Shows up. Here, look at chapter 29, verse 1. Ezekiel 29, verse 1. In the tenth year, the tenth month, and the twelfth day of the month, the, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and what? Prophesy. Yet the same thing in chapter 30, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God. Come back now and close in conclusion of 1 Thessalonians 4. Folks, when the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, and he says, For this we say unto you, by what? By the word of the Lord. What he's doing is he's evoking the prophetic authority. He's using the statement from the Old Testament to tell you and to tell me and to tell the Thessalonians how this dispensation will what? will end. It will end with the Lord appearing in the air to catch away what? Folks, all these people that want to put the church, the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, on into the seventh week of Daniel have not recognized what this is saying. The next prophecy to be fulfilled 
is not a prophetic statement issued by Isaiah, Zechariah, Jeremiah, or any prophet of old. It's a prophetic statement from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. This dispensation will end with the Lord appearing in the air to catch away his saints. And how do you know it will happen? By the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for the saints and their patience and for the opportunity to preach your word and just grateful for the, the weekend that we have here for fellowship and study. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.